Good morning. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome everyone to Harvard School of Dental Medicine's Continuing Professional Education, CPE, today talk number four, entitled Oral Medicine and Pathology During the COVID-19 Pandemic, The Show Must Go On. My name is Dr. David Kim. I'm the director of CPE at Harvard School of Dental Medicine, and I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Nathaniel Trister. Dr. Trister is chief of the Division of Oral Medicine and Dentistry at Brigham Women's Hospital and clinical director of oral medicine and oral oncology at the Dana-Farber Brigham Women's Cancer Center. He is also an associate professor of oral medicine at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Trister, oral medicine, oral pathology specialists work closely with a wide and diverse group of health professionals to provide treatments to patients with complex medical conditions. Patients referred to you may be suffering from debilitating mucosal diseases, or there may be high suspicion for malignancy. Many of your patients require dental clearance prior to schedule essential medical procedures. We want to find out how your practice has been changed, impacted, adapted, since dentists have been recommended to see only urgency or urgent cases. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, indeed, we've had to adapt to this new recommendation from the Mass Dental Society. We're also working within the guidelines set forth by Brigham Women's Hospital, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and the overall partners MGB parent organization. So we've had to, to quickly pivot and incorporate teledentistry and other communication modes to see both new patients and scheduled follow-up patients. It's been a fairly remarkable process requiring an incredible amount of education and training, coordination, oper oper operationalization, and management. Uh, many of our colleagues in the US and around the world have had parallel experiences. So for today, I've asked two of my colleagues at the school and hospital to present how they've been providing patient care during this unique period. It's my great pleasure to introduce our two presenters for today who will provide timely, and I think a quite interesting insight into the practice of oral medicine and oral pathology during the COVID pandemic. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hervé Srusi. He's an associate surgeon and the director of research in the division of oral medicine and dentistry at Brigham Women's Hospital. He's also an associate professor of oral medicine at Harvard School of Dental Medicine and a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Medicine. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rishma Menon. She's a lecturer at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine and she's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology and a fellow of the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology. So we're gonna have uh, a presentation by, by both of our, our guest uh, speakers today um, they're going to talk about teledentist teledentistry during the pandemic, uh, two real but virtual cases from the clinic, as well as uh, practical approaches to clinical and oral maxillofacial pathology. And you'll see how these, these work very well together. And then we're going to follow this by a discussion uh, with some questions that we have prepared. And we also hope uh, that there might be some questions from, uh, from the audience uh, that we can incorporate as well. So I think without uh, further ado, Dr. Srusi, Dr. Menon, uh, we're going to turn the discussion over to the two of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Trister. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, before getting into my first case, um, I, I would like to, um, if we could go back one slide, um, discuss a little bit the expectation and, and if you want, we all had, because we all had experience with uh, virtual uh, video chat with friends and, and so on. So one of the things that I expected was it could be useful at certain time. I expected that it would be probably better, easier to do established patients than new patients. That there would be a difference between those who have lesions, that tangible lesion that could be examined, as opposed to those who, let's say, have symptoms that not necessarily relate to somatic changes you could see. I also thought that pictures would be very valuable if you could get patients to provide photographs before the consultation would be very useful. And, and finally, I thought that video chat was probably better than a phone call, allowing me to read facial expression of the patient and the patient do the same with me. So next slide. Um, here's my first case. This is a 32-year-old, a, a Caucasian woman 
with a medical history that is defined here, uterine lymoma, anter anterior chest wall lipoma, bilateral retinal degeneration. And she presented for the evaluation of a mucosal lesion on the lower labial mucosa. She essentially noticed it uh, around two months ago. It seemed to have happened after she bit her lip. Uh, there was no change in appearance. She denied any symptom, no pain, no numbness, no sensitivity. This was the first occurrence of such lesion, and she denied having a similar lesion anywhere else on her skin or any other mucosal surfaces in her body. Next slide. So in the context here, we requested the patient provide a picture, and, and we, have a, we had an administrative person that, that coordinated this kind of visit that helped with that. So we had this picture. As, as you can see, the picture is actually not too bad, taken by a patient, and you can see that little uh, lesion on the lower lip around five millimeter, a little bubble if you want, a little lump. It, it, you know, you can palpate, it seems soft, given the history, the age of the patient, the presentation, its location, and so on. We seem to be very comfortable with this kind of uh, assessment. So next slide, we uh, discussed the finding of the patient. I told her, I thanked her for the picture. I told her that my clinical diagnosis is based on this, was this, essentially this was a mucosal, and we discussed management option from wait and see to excision. Uh, we then agreed to reevaluate re the lesion in person in three months if the lesion was still there. And, and at that time, we uh, examined the issue of excisional biopsy as opposed to continued follow up. Of course, we made it clear that we are available in the meanwhile if anything were to change. So, um, next slide. So, here, very useful, very excited. This is great, great way to provide care to our patient. Uh, is there anything that could have helped improve the experience? I'm not sure. This seemed to be very smooth and working very well. And then the question is, could this be done virtually again? I mean, could we do this visit even after COVID goes away? And the answer is yes. Why not? This actually saved the, pers the person, the trip, and the parking cost and whatnot. And this could be done uh, again if, even after COVID is done. So on this happy note, uh, I, uh, uh, I would like to uh, introduce my colleague, Dr. Menon. Dr. Menon will give her perspective from a neuropathology uh, standpoint as to how to provide care in the COVID uh, pandemic era. Thank you, Dr. Strosi. Um, so I'm here to provide uh, sort of the practical approaches of um, a clinical or path, uh, pathology. And as you all already know, uh, we both our pathologists and oral medicine specialists see patients and we work very close, uh, closely together to provide care. Typically a patient um, would be seen uh, for exams and interpretations at the beginning. You take a thorough history, uh, take radiographs if they don't have it already, and perform an, a thorough extraoral and intraoral exam. Uh, try to obtain clinical photos um, at, from the, from the get-go at the first visit. After which we move on to your working diagnosis, which could be a differential, and then you're deciding whether you want to use diagnostic adjuncts, cytology, culture, et cetera. And then do you really want to biopsy it to confirm the diagnosis? And you, we use a different, different types of um, modalities as listed here. And then finally, the patient is uh, managed. Do they need further surgery? Is this going to be medication or maybe no treatment at all? So why biopsy in the first place? A biopsy really is the ultimate validation or confirmation of what is really going on, right? You wanna take a piece, look at it at the uh, uh, microscope, and um, you can 99% of the time when the biopsy tissue specimen is adequate, it, we can tell what is going on. And that is really useful, especially um, in suspicious lesions, et cetera. The million dollar question really is whether to biopsy or not. COVID or no COVID, right? Especially more so now because of how um, we want to decide whether it's really that urgent. The patient does the patient really need to be called in, considering everything. Um, and I speak from the dental school's perspective. Uh, um, Dr. Patricia and uh, uh, Shusi will will probably give us a perspective about things from the hospital as well, which may be slightly different. But really the, uh, the, the big question is, do, is how urgent is this? Do we really need to call the patient in? Um, and to help us with that uh, decision, here is my take on the different pathologies of the oral maxillofacial region. You can classify them based on either location and appearance. And this would be extremely important to do so when you write, uh, fill out your requisition form 
for any type of communication that the pathologist receives into whether it's mucosal or intraosseous based on the location, what do these really look like? Are they white flat lesions? Are they ulcers, erythema, nodules, masses, et cetera? And then on the other hand, it, you can also describe it uh, from this really um, uh, in-depth tree infographic that I have here on the right, um, which is uh, uh, classifying pathology based on their eater pathogenesis, really. So that's going a step further. But definitely the more information we get on the requisition form, the more helpful it is when um, uh, 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 really getting that diagnosis out. All right, the big questions are, like we said already, to biopsy or not. And let's look at that in perspective of white lesions. So here you have a patient who has this white, flat, plaque type of lesion uh, that's on the retromolar pad. But if I told you this patient had a super uh, erupted tooth on the opposing arch that is really pounding food into this area, then you're thinking maybe it's more sort of reactive, traumatic type of a lesion. And indeed, this was biopsied and was called a benign alveolar ridge keratosis. These are not pre-malignant, they're totally benign, and there's no chance of this becoming um, a cancer. Another white lesion, slightly different flavor to this because you get to see a little more red and yellow. Um, this is ulcerated. And this patient had this uh, lesion and had the similar lesion on, their bile, on the other buccal mucosa as well, on the opposite buccal mucosa. And this was biopsy. It was indeed a classic oral lichen planus. Uh, this one is slightly different because you're uh, seeing a white plaque that is pretty large. If you think about it, it extends from about here to there. And if you were a tiny person or even a, um, a dentist wearing loops and you looked at it, you'd... Uh, uh, see little divots in the surface of this lesion, uh, hence it's fissured. So I'm getting a little worried when someone sends me a photograph like this. And indeed, it, it, is, it was diagnosed um, as mild dysplasia in this patient. Clinically, these are called leukoplakias. So what makes something white? Um, it's basically, uh, you have, uh, it could either be thick keratin, alteration to the keratinocytes, like in dysplasia, thick keratin, like in this benign alveolar rich keratosis, a thick Thick layer of epithelium can make something look white, and other entities like fibrosis can also look white um, because of what it looks like histologically. But why do we need to um, detect these early, especially now more so than ever? Because really, the patient's best chance for improved survival is early detection, as shown by this five year survival rate for oral squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so that's your chance at making, you know, helping this patient out. Another entity that we look uh, see often in these uh, in, in the clinics are ulcers, and uh, I just want to at the get go uh, talk about what an ulcer looks like histologically for a second. Here, so here on the left you have normal epithelium, and then when you have a break in the epithelium, that's what an ulcer is. Um, it looks yellow because of that fibrin, and um, maybe a little red because of, of all these extravasated red blood cells. There's uh, granulation tissue. So that's what an ulcer looks like. So with that in mind, um, here's a child, um, uh, an adolescent who had these ulcers that are, uh, you can imagine pretty painful um, and a biopsy was performed and this was a uh, recurrent aphthis. So it was uh, aphthis that came and went. Um, and then in this case, this was a patient who had this ulcer, and you can see there's, slightly, there's a slightly sclerotic um, margin to it. He was traumatizing it on a sharp tooth cusp, which is not seen here, an example of a traumatic ulcerative granuloma. And here's another very interesting case um, of a patient who was immunocompromised. She had Crest syndrome. Um, and here's an example of an ulcerated lesion. It's not so much an ulcer, right? It's an ulcer ulcerated lesion, and this was biopsied. Um, and was a squamous cell carcinoma in this patient. So my point here is ulcers are all not created equal. You really want to have that high threshold of suspicion for a non-healing ulcer. So what have we been doing at HSDM during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? We have had, um, we're, our operations are very limited as with everyone around the world, I would imagine. Um, but we have been relying a lot on telemedicine for referral, and that could be as simple as um, a student getting a call about a patient who sends a photograph in, and then that is sent to me via, via our uh, electronic health recording system. Uh, I send um, a differential and many, many more questions, um, and really that's about it. And then you try to uh, offer them um, some kind of an answer about what might be going on. 
Um, and then it, uh, the, the, many times we uh, get to speak with the patient um, uh, via video call. So that is also helpful. Something to just quell the anxiety of, you know, both the patient and what is going on. Uh, biopsy pr procedures have been limited to only what is really necessary, like I mentioned before, like with your leukoplakias and neoplasias and suspicious uh, premalignant lesions. So what's working well is really maintaining an open line of communication with both the patient, the student who may be dealing with this, and the other attendings who may be involved. Um, we work very close with all our discipline directors at the dental school, so that has been great where we can just shoot an email and you know, ask for advice. So that's been really great, and I think maintaining an open line of communication has been great, again, COVID or not. At the end of the day, patient awareness is also important. So when you do give them these uh, uh, differentials or these diagnoses, a working diagnosis of what you might be dealing with, it's always helpful to ask or rather let the patient know what you might be thinking it is and also what you think it most likely is and a little bit about each entity that you may um, render diagnosis of. And then ultimately, please, please take and get pictures because that really helps um, with uh, uh, giving the, the patient an answer. Here's an example of a, a patient uh, from Boston who I saw, um, via virtually that is when I say saw. And she, I see her routinely for another condition, but she was worried about um, this little nodule uh, that you can see in the buccal mucosa. And this is a picture she took on her own. Ideal, yes, uh, this is not an ideal uh, picture, but uh, something is better than nothing at this point. And um, really she was only so anxious about everything going on and she didn't realize that she had this identical um, opening of the stem and stuck on the other side of the buccal mucosa as well. But she was so relieved to see and know that that was all that it was. So it really helps to be able to communicate with the patient, even though we're all, you know, this is really trying times and we're going through a lot. But the take home message really is, um, when in doubt, phone a friend. Ideally, you have someone who's an oral medicine or pathology uh, specialist. A referral is always great. Um, at the end of the day, you definitely need to biopsy pre-malignant and suspicious lesions and, um, and cancer. Uh, diagnostic adjuncts uh, are useful. And finally, uh, ideally, you want to communicate as thoroughly as possible and document all that you do. So that's my uh, sort of practical approaches to some of the um, uh, uh, things we've been dealing with. Again, COVID or not COVID, but some questions are more important to be answered now, especially with everything going on. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go back to case two with Dr. Strusi. Um, thank you for that first really cool case. I'm excited to hear about the ca uh, next case. Thank you very much, Dr. Menon. And, and um, let me now go over a second case and give you a different experience of uh, telemedicine, teledentistry, if you want. So this is an 82-year-old uh, uh, lady with a history of breast and endometrial cancer, glaucoma, hypertension, and joint replacement surgery. Now, I want to make a clear point here where we uh, try to have her, and we use Zoom as a video platform, we try to have her use Zoom. It was not possible for her to do so, so that essentially that initial consultation, this is an initial consultation, patient we've never seen before, uh, occurred over a phone. What she told us essentially is that she had all lesion that simply would not go away. She had quite a bit of pain, seven, eight pain at rest, with difficulty eating, and extreme difficulties, I would say, performing uh, home oral hygiene. The lesions were present for two months and occurred simultaneously with ocular lesions. Um, she uh, also reported significant amount of, uh, of bleeding, which uh, clearly um, uh, made sense when, when I tell you what the diagnosis was. And the diagnosis was cicatricial pemphigoid, and that diagnosis was supported by a biopsy that was obtained by, the, by a inner mouth by a neurosurgeon in February of 2020. The biopsy also showed uh, uh, in its direct immunofluorescence deposit of IgA or, along the basement membrane zone, which indicates, you know, uh, it supports the biopsy, but from a clinical standpoint, may it indicate that it may, may be a, a lesion difficult to control a little more than it would be otherwise. She was currently on 60 milligrams of prednisone and was waiting for insurance company to approve, uh, uh, to approve cell cell. And she was going to start self sap at 500 milligram initially, but she was waiting for insurance to approve that. And again, to get back to that uh, era we live in of, of COVID modification of treatment, 
her um, ophthalmologist, we wanted to tr start her on rituxan infusion, but rituxan infusion would require her coming to the medical center for these infusions. And given her age and given where we stand with all this, uh, it was the hope of the ophthalmologist who was managing the systemic um, uh, management tree of that patient that, that, that uh, this would be delayed or, and that in fact that prednisone cell sept uh, uh, treatment would give us the initial response and hopefully uh, later on, if needed, she would be brought in for the rituxan infusion. So next slide. So as always, there's an important aspect of how we manage patients, which is to discuss the diagnosis, discuss manage management option and prognosis and educate the patient. And so we did that and we explained to her uh, how, how this is significant to all, all health. It was also very clear that she was extremely concerned that her inability to perform oral hygiene functions at home would essentially lead to a lot of damage to her periodontium and teeth. And, and she was correct. And not only that, in fact, the lack of home uh, hygiene, if you want, uh, was also contributing to the disease and, it's, and, and eventually our ability to control it. So it was very important to find, and we discussed several treatment options, electric toothbrush, soft toothbrush, uh, changing maybe uh, to a toothpaste that would be uh, less, uh, for which you would have less sensitivity or pediatric toothpaste or whatnot. We also did what we often do with this patient, despite the systemic treatment, is to add an adjuvant topical treatment. And the adjuvant topical treatment, treatment we recommended for her were dexamethasone and astatin rinses, asking her to mix these two together. And the dexamethasone, the topical steroid as a rinse, she would go everywhere and treat all parts of her mouth. Uh, and it seems from what she was telling us that many uh, anatomical sites of her mouth were involved, not just the gingiva. And, and then the nastatin would be a prophylactic antifungal treatment. So we say, let's start with this. You know, we know you're starting 60 milligram prednisone. We know you're going on cell sap. Let's see how things evolve. Let's meet again in three weeks. So three weeks later, we met again. And next slide. I have first excellent news. We were able to go on Zoom. We were able to discuss and build that report. And that was very useful. And she told us, I am much better. My spontaneous gingival bleeding is gone. I have found a way to perform oral hygiene at home. She switched to an electric toothbrush with soft brittle. And in part, it may be the change in method. And in part, it may be that she was simply responding to the systemic and topical treatment that she was on. She said, my symptoms are 75% better than they were when I first talked to you three weeks ago. She was compliant with the uh, management strategy we gave her, which is the dexamethasone and statin rinses, done three times a day for five minutes. We asked the patient not to eat and drink for 20 minutes after that, just that it wouldn't get washed out. And she reported no side effect, no indication that despite the prophylactic antifungal, she would have had any kind of uh, 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 symptoms of yeast infection in her mouth. There's no indication also that she had any side effect from the prednisone she was on. This, mind you, an 82 year old lady on 60 milligram prednisone at that time. Now, as far as eyes were concerned, she was recently uh, given contact lens bandages for cornea. She seemed to uh, uh, be at a, at a very drop. She mentioned actually that she had to keep on washing her eyes every half an hour or so because they were crusting. And she was actually more concerned with her eyes than she was concerned with her mouth at this point. She was still on 60 milligram prednisone, by the way. Her cell sap uh, was at 500 milligram twice a day at this point. Um, she was concerned that cell sap did not seem to help. She thought that would be some kind of a, 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 a miracle cure. It would add tremendous, but it didn't yet. And, and we tried to encourage it to continue because we know that cell sap takes quite a while before it kicks in in order to get really a, a treatment response for it. And as far as the rituxan, the rituximab infusion, a primary team continued to consider this because again, and maybe mostly because of the ocular lesion, they, if this was not, if we were not in 2020 and COVID-19 did not exist, this patient would have started uh, by then with the infusion. But again, treatment modification, necessity of the time, this was not part of it. So our next slide. So we, can, we asked her to continue the hexamethasone astatin rinse. Uh, in the conversation we had with her, while the, the gingiva was much better, she did mention that what, that was one ulcer in her tongue. That was the bulk of the, uh, the symptoms she had at this point. So we also introduced the clobetazole gel treatment that, would, that she could apply there. We asked her whether she was accessible to her. She was actually on the video showing her 
the, the lesion where it was. You couldn't see much from the video, but sufficiently we could understand that she had an ulcer on the side of her tongue. She could put a finger on it, and she could put a finger on it. She could apply clobetazole gel, and that would help her as well. So we introduced that also to the management approach. We schedule a visit in six weeks, still virtual. We don't know where we're going to be at the time, and and we discussed an in-person visit. And it is clear to me that this kind of case would eventually require an in-person visit. That there is no way uh, first uh, that we should manage patients like this uh, virtually only, and, and that we should talk about an in-person in in visit, but it was not the time yet to be able to schedule that because we don't know where we're gonna be in a month or two. And you know, this is an 82 year old woman with, uh, you know, with a heavy medical history and so on, and there's no reason, especially if, if we immunosuppress her with prednisone and Celsef to bring her into the medical center at this point. Next slide. So what did we learn? And, and you know, we came with expectation and what did we learn? Was it useful? Yes, this was useful. And you know, for the past uh, few weeks now, we've been uh, delivering care through Zoom or sometimes phone call. Um, and it is always useful. And, and it's always useful because it could be that in fact, no resolution can occur. No management resolution can occur through this interaction other than to say, I have to see you in person. And then you have to weigh the risk benefit of that. If this is the resolution of the case, we say, look, I can't see the ulcer, I don't understand what you have, and potentially uh, the differential diagnosis would in include concerning diagnosis, then fine. Then the resolution is that the patient has to come in. So it is, in my view, always useful, at least in this era, to, con to conduct this kind of thing. Well, what could have helped improve the experience? I mean, there is the technical aspect of training our patients or through maybe using the staff to make sure they can go into that, to teach them to take pictures and so on. This is complicated, it's demanding. The staff is itself very stressed by the amount of interaction we get. This could happen and they may be, and we'll discuss that later as to whether other people have experience with that and whether you can suggest a way to improve this kind of interaction. And then the question is, could this be done virtually after the post COVID, in the post-COVID world. And I will first say, first and foremost, that I'm in no way uh, comfortable that I would manage patients with conditions such as cicatricial pemphigoid without seeing them. Maybe for some established patients, some recall visit, yes, but that there would be no face-to-face -face interaction in the post-COVID world for this kind of patient is simply not reasonable. Uh, but uh, as you can see, we made progress. Uh, we could get the patient to improve. We could educate the patient, help her solve the oral hygiene, bring in some topical adjuvant treatment or systemic treatment. And we were making progress in this case. And there's no doubt that there's value to it, but, but not as the only way of doing that. So next slide. I will now address my initial expectation and where I stand at this point. Again, as I said, it, it's not that it could be useful sometimes. It is always useful. It's an issue of allocation of time and resource. If you can have a video call with any patient before they come in and, and sort it out, especially in a medical center such as ours, where we have patients coming from very far away, we know traffic in Boston, we know how difficult it is to park, the cost and whatnot, the older people are hard to move. Yes, always useful to decide and sort out. We should come now. Established as opposed to new patient, well, yes, but I gave you in the first example a case of a new patient where it worked beautifully well. So it's not so much about establishing a new patient. That's one parameter, of course, but it's also what you're dealing with. So the issue of tangible lesion as things that you cannot examine. One issue with this is that, especially in the new patient, the fact that a patient may be reporting symptoms that may be at the end neurogenic with no uh, somatic finding, no objective finding, is something that you can only assert by actually examining the patient. So you can't simply, you know, if you have a patient with the so-called burning mouth syndrome, or all this anesthesia, and they present with all the classic pattern, you can't really tell a patient like that, that there is nothing causal that would explain their burning or their, or their pain or their needles or whatever symptoms they have without the examination. So especially in a new patient, that has to be established. And, and it, it is a big difference between these two. Now, providing, uh, photograph. As my colleague Dr. Menon said, it is very valuable. Photographs are very valuable, and you'll see some uh, some interesting photographs a bit later. And um, as far as the video chat versus the phone call, so we've had both with this patient. And yes, the interaction, the report you can build the patient is much better on a video chat than it would be on this on the phone call. 
So with this said, I, I will end my presentation now and, and give the, the baton back to Dr. Tristan. Great. Thank you both so much. Uh, so he, so here's, a, here's a great clinical photo for everyone to wrap their heads around um, that was actually sent to us last week. Um, so I really want to thank both of you so much. Um, this is an excellent presentation. I think we've gained a lot, of, uh, a lot of great insight and information about how we're all managing this and how oral medicine and pathology care is being provided during this, this interesting period. Um, so we've had a few questions and actually um, we've obviously, we have some, a, few, a few prepared questions. One, one of the questions that came through, um, I am actually gonna address very quickly because it's actually very relevant because um, some of these questions are coming from all over the world. One of the questions was, was asking if we can actually prescribe for these patients when we see them virtually. And um, the short answer is yes. Um, I wouldn't wanna answer for the entire country and every state and every institution um, but these virtual visits, um, you know, do serve in place of uh, an in-clinic visit with the understanding that, especially for a new patient, that we will see them uh, it, when, when the time is appropriate. Um, but with that being said, um, given the consenting process, um, patient agreeing to the visit, um, and the clinician using, obviously, their, their best clinical um, uh, approach to the diagnosis and management, uh, we very much can and do. So, you know, Dr. Strusi showed a great example of um, team approach to care and managing a patient with uh, quite complex uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid or cicatricial pemphigoid. Um, I was involved in, in managing a patient uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks with a, with a new diagnosis of, of pemphigus vulgaris. Um, that with confirmation of pathology that had been um, already obtained but not actually confirmed with a diagnosis, we indeed were, were able to start, um, in this case, you know, really critical uh, systemic therapy for a patient. So it, it's actually been very eye-opening for all of us. Um, so thank you for whoever that was from, uh, from Brazil, I believe, who's, who submitted that question because there are differences in who can, pres who can prescribe uh, various medications and in what context those medications can be prescribed. So I wanted to take this opportunity. We have, we have a few questions. We have about 15 minutes for, for questions. And after I ask this question, I'm going to look and see what other questions are coming in. Um, and actually, I think the first one I want to start with has us take a little bit of a step back. And that's that um, we all know the pandemic has brought to light many, many societal inequities with many uh, haves and have nots experiences being quite different. Uh, in many cases, and not, not just related to, of course, um, access to medicine. I'm, I'm wondering if the two of you can at least try to comment on how this potentially may be impacting uh, oral medicine care during this period, and what, if any, lessons may be taken from this looking into the future about how we, uh, how we tr try to provide care and provide access to care um, to as many people as possible. Whoever would like to start. So, so you know, the issue of access to care. Um, the question is, is telemedicine adding a hurdle? I mean, the issue, telemedicine may in a way resolve or add hurdles to, to the pro providing care. It may in a way resolve hurdles in the sense that, um, let's say having an 82 year old patient that cannot easily come to a clinic uh, requires the resource, require, requires someone to drive her uh, whether that would be provided by friend or family or by some kind of uh, service that do that for her, where providing healthcare at distance may in a way reduce the hurdle in access to care. On the other hand, of course, as we know that in education as well, in the field of education, the fact that you need a computer, the fact that you need internet access, the fact that you need to be savvy enough and be exposed to it may be an additional hurdle that may hurt those who already are suffering from lack of access to care. So it may, it's a, it's a two, two, side, uh, you know, there's two edges to that sword. And, and, and so it may help in a way, but make it more difficult for some as well. We have to be cognizant of that. And from that standpoint, uh, even if the Zoom doesn't work, even we would, if we would like to see the face of a patient and so on, most people at least have a phone and we can do that over the phone and we should not deny access to those who don't have internet or access to Zoom or, or don't have the, the technical skills to be able to do that. Uh, yeah, I totally, I totally second that. I agree. It has really helped with triaging uh, more straightforward cases and not so much the, the complicated ones like, uh, uh, like you just discussed. 
Um, it, it, patients are definitely at a dis disadvantage when they need to be tech savvy and they are living on their own and, you know, those kinds of situations. Um, so that's definitely brought, uh, 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 it's definitely come up a lot when you see um, uh, uh, a number of different uh, patients. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Good. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch up the order a little bit because there was another good question that came in that I think dovetails a little bit with one of the other questions we had. Um, there was a question asking about what type of um, medically necessary or uh, essential urgent dental care um, has been provided during this period. And I think that might, might be something that Dr. Srusi can answer a bit better just because of um, him working out of our, our hospital-based practice at, at Brigham Women's Hospital. But I think in, in addition, there was that question and one of the questions we had prepared was, uh, you know, in, in that context, if, if you could also contact, uh, if you could also um, comment on any mandated screenings um, that are done for the patients who are scheduled to be seen and then specifically for patients who will be undergoing um, dental procedures that might be aerosol generating. Yeah. We'll, we'll try, try and keep that a fairly small packaged answer. Yes, so that's a long question. I'll make it a short answer. We in our clinic uh, provide not only mucosal and, and oral medicine, and we also provide dentistry in, in medically comp compromised people in general, but we have found ourselves during this pandemic providing care and we build this interaction with the emergency department where people have a dentist, they can't access care, come to the ED, and we provide the essential care. So we have provided, you know, a crown has fallen, a filling has fallen, a dental abscess is there. We have provided care actually recently to some of our frontline workers. We have an emergency uh, room uh, doctor who is providing care to the COVID patient who had uh, an amalgam feeling fallout and needed. And so we don't, we, pro, you know, we just uh, examine the patient and took a radiograph and, and quickly put some kind of temporary restoration in there just to get that patient through that period. So we do provide this. Now, as far as guidelines, uh, as long as we examine people, we have taken biopsies also of patients and we, um, we have done intralesional injection in, in, in inflammatory condition on this patient. We've done that with an N95 mask, uh, we have a face shield and, uh, and totally covered with a head cover as well, uh, but the patient was not COVID tested. Now in those cases where we needed to provide a care that would require actually drilling or potentially drilling, then we have sent the patient for COVID testing. We're able to do that, order that. The turnaround time is essentially, we can order that the day before and we'll get by next day. If the patient tests COVID negative, we still come in with the same precaution we talked about and provide that care. We've had patients uh, just as uh, recently, we had a couple of people who were essentially in the pipeline for a long transplant and have a, a source of dental infection, broken roots that may be a source of infection that needs to be dealt with so that the patient can go on the list for transplant. So clearly this is one of those cases where waiting for the dental office to open is not reasonable. So we have provided this kind of care. And now I wanna say that this precaution, I think we came up with in our medical center as to who should be COVID tested, who shouldn't. And this is something that is in flux, like everything else in this field. And while you hear this version from me right now, you may hear a different version from me in a week or two, and you may hear a different version in different healthcare centers. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Rishma, do you have anything you wanted to add? Oh, not to that specifically. That's still okay. hospital based. I mean, just with the way we've been, everything has been happening at the school. I think yeah, Dr. Strizzi is definitely a better answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll, I'll let you take the, I'll take you, I'll let you take the first lead on this next question. Um, this is one of the ones we had talked about. So, um, so during the pandemic and in particular with the stay at home orders, which are still, um, still in place as of today in Massachusetts, uh, people have been spending a great deal of time online, as we know, um, and we're also aware that patients who have problems are in many cases delaying care due to fair visiting hospitals and clinics. We've all heard about the, um, the, the numbers of emergency room visits being significantly down um, across the country, for example. So uh, how, how can a non-health professional who's seeking information about a potential oral medicine problem, uh, maybe something they're actually quite concerned about, find information that would lead to seeing an appropriate specialist like one of the two of you. And Rishma, I'll let you start. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a really a great question. I, I, I honestly think one of the ways to, I mean, and that's probably where teledentistry is and telemedicine has sort of helped in this situation uh, because I've had patients reach out and uh, 
uh, first of all, ask me if uh, these are the kinds of things I treat and if I uh, am able to, you know, provide advice, do, do I need to come in in person, those kinds of things. So it's great that, you know, tell it this exists because you can, um, you know, send an email and uh, get answers almost immediately or within 24 hours at least. So that has been really helpful. Um, in general, I, I think uh, uh, it's, it's great what you all are doing, especially you have um, a, a great access to medical information on your website, on the Brigham and Women's um, Hospital or Medicine page. You know, patients can go look that up and definitely see if some of the symptoms match to what they are experiencing and, you know, to see if they really need to take those extra steps. So I, I think um, reaching out and communication is probably the best way rather than, you know, uh, 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 maybe uh, doing a Google search on it and, you know, getting totally terrified about what they may potentially not even have. Good. Thank you. Uh, Hervé, do you have anything to add? No, I don't. Okay. So, so I, I, uh, there was a nice, a nice question comment that came in that I think I'm going to react to before we get to maybe one other question. And it was, it was actually a, a comment from a colleague of ours about the importance of having that initial um, visit with a patient to really establish rapport, develop trust, and to be able to sort of guide the guide the path forward. And um, I think maybe I'll leave it there. And I'm curious to um, what the two of yours experiences have been with how, how, how that connection has been made or not made either over the phone or by video in some of your situations. I, I could talk extensively about it because I, I've been actually pretty amazed by what, what we can accomplish with someone we've never met before, but I, I'd like to, I want the, I want the experts to speak. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's not ideal, but, but on the other hand, I think there is the ability and, you know, I'm, I mean, you know, I have gray hair. I'm not in a generation uh, where I would meet someone online and marry them without meeting them and which I understand may be comfortable to the newer generation. So I, I'm not, uh, no, no, am I an early adapter? Uh, so, uh, look, uh, the bottom line is yes. Interacting with patient directly, all the non-verbal uh, 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 clues that you get in these cues that you get in this kind of interaction, and the fact that you have a 2D picture of your face that sometimes goes in and out and so on uh, of the of the screen, it's not ideal. But and and yet, I, I will say this: there's no patient that I've seen through Zoom with whom I didn't interact physically beforehand that I wouldn't want to interact eventually with. So there's no way that for me, it seems reasonable to see a patient for the first time on Zoom, manage whatever condition they have, even if it seems to be very successful from this interaction. You may have a patient with a yeast infection in their mouth, you recognize it by, by, by symptom, by pictures I send, maybe even the patient opening their mouth in front of the camera, you, you send them a course of antifungal medicine, you know why they had a yeast infection, let's say they went a course of antibiotic for that. I don't think that for me, for, and that's my opinion, that it, it, I could end it there. There has to be a time where I would interact physically with this patient, bring them in, even if they are well, just for well visit, if you want, to kind of close the chapter. Yep, I and agree. I agree. And I, I think that patients actually are looking for that as well. So um, some of them are, you know, asking to be seen even sooner than we would expect in, in that in that situation. Um, yes. Rishma, did you have anything you wanted to, to add or say? I was just going to say that I think a connection is a connection, virtual or not. Uh, I think patients really appreciate being able to see who they're connecting with. Um, and uh, I think e even in these times, I've made several new connections, patients or not, uh, even virtually. So I think that's really helpful to be available to your patients um, uh, and you know, for them to be able to make that connection, virtual or not. So I think it's a great tool we have uh, right now. Yes, we're not going to be able to do everything <laughs> virtually, but um, that's a start, I think. Good, good. These are great questions, and I'm, I'm really glad we got to actually incorporate some of the, these live questions coming in. There's a lot of really good ones, unfortunately. Um, not only can we not get to those questions, we can't get to even other questions that we had prepared, uh, because time flies when you're having fun. Um, but as we said, the show has to go on, and I guess now the show going on means that we're just up at uh, 11.45, so it's time, time to start wrapping things up. Um, but really want to thank both of the panelists, Dr. Srusi and Dr. Menon, for their invaluable information. Thank you for taking the time. Um, it's just like, just like when we're hanging out in the room talking, but we're all in three different places right now. 
Um, also, just thank you everyone from um, throughout the, the Harvard system and, and well beyond. Um, nice seeing some, some familiar names and some of the chats coming in, um, truly from locally and all over the world. So it, it's really touching. And um, I just, uh, again, um, hope everyone is staying safe, stays as well connected as possible as we uh, continue na to navigate through all this, as Dr. Srusi and Dr. Menon both mentioned a few times. You know, there's no answers here. Even some of the questions that came in are great questions, um, but I wouldn't even dare address them because what we do here may be different from what's gonna be done at the dental school, which may be different from what's gonna be done over at the Mass General Hospital where Dr. Kim works. So um, I think with that, I will, uh, I will see if Dr. Kim has any final thoughts. Sure. On behalf of the Harvard School of Dental Medicine Continuing Professional Education Committee, we'd like to thank our presenters and moderator for enlightening us with a valuable information as we are uh, getting prepared to reopen our dental practices. Next Tuesday, which is May 26th, we'll have our CPE Today Talk number five entitled Remote Orthodontic Care Beyond the Pandemic and presenters will be from Harvard School of Dental Medicine and Massachusetts General Hospital Dental Group. Please visit our school's website, which is www.hsdm.harvard.edu for registration. And also you could download the previous uh, CP Today Talk series, number one through three, and number four is being ready right now. So please join us. And then uh, for additional uh, seminar next week, and as Dr. Teresa has mentioned, we like everyone to be safe and we are ready to go back to our offices and then to our hospital. And we'd like to thank everyone for turning in, tuning in to our CP Today Talk series. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You will.